I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Villara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Reed Goosens. Uh, Reed, first of all, thank you for coming on the show today. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Hi Jason, my pleasure, my friend, and uh, great to be talking to another fellow Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Both here in sunny Southern California. Um, so just as a, as a quick intro, uh, in, in 2012, Reed quit his job in Australia. You may have noticed the accent, uh, moved halfway across the globe and, uh, came to the U S to, to kind of change, change your life. So I think that's a much better story told from your perspective. So, sure. um, if you would maybe give us, give us your background and then, uh, we'll kind of, kind of dive in from there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, moved here in 2012, um, really just to, to be an expat. I really loved New York City when I backpacked through there back in 2009. So I moved to the US really to chase, to live in New York City, but also to chase a girl. And that girl is now my wife. Um, so she um, she's from, she resi- she's from LA, hence why we now live in Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, been in, the, been in the US for a couple of, it's been a decade now. Um, and in that time, I, I moved here. Um, my background's in structural engineering. So I moved here without a job. And I came on a tourist visa and I just went door knocking to every single engineering joint in New York City until someone finally gave me a job. Uh, through that, I was able to get you know a visa to stay. And um, as they say, the rest is history. So um, I'm sure there's a lot more that goes on there. I'm being, I'm being facetious. But in general, um, what I've done today is, you know, built, built two different uh, syndication platforms uh, and we've been involved with about $650 million assets under management to date. Um, we recently just closed on our first acquisition in South Carolina uh, back in September 2022 and uh, building the team. And, you know, I, I sort of, I, I come on these shows not to necessarily boast about what I've been able to achieve, but more to, to, to show people that if an Australian can do it, move halfway across the world, give it a crack, as I like to say, uh, then so can the average American. It's just about taking that action, right? And 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 this, this, you know, I've got so many stories in there that I can talk about how to take that action in specific ways in order to make it, you know, to build it to what I built today. And a lot of people think, oh, wow, you built so, you know, 3,000 doors and counting and, you know, all, all this, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it took a lot of hard work, it took a lot of discipline, and, and I'm more than happy to, to dive into those specific things if, if you want to about you know sharing the knowledge with other people so they can hopefully do this you know do the same or emulate what the success, success quote unquote that I've have. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, that's you know really you have you have a lot of success you have you know we talk about people always refer to assets under management and unit counts and things like that and those are those are super impressive but i think and you glossed over you know sort of the in between but you came to the us as a structural engineer so how did you how did you then decide okay i'm going to make that change to you know move into the real estate world what, what was that you know sort of motivation there and, and and what did that look like in the beginning for you well, actually, it started before moving to the US. I, I had been, uh, I'd lived abroad in 2008 and 2009 in London and in the south of France. And when I moved back to Australia in 2010, it was sitting in my day job, you know, I think it was 24, 25 at the, at the, uh, at the time, and just feel, feeling like I was a small piece in a large machine, um, feeling like my life was passing me by. And, and through just a curiosity of wanting to, you know, someone to pay me to live my life and go surfing and travel, you know, I was like, I need to do more, like, I didn't, I didn't know what passive income was. I didn't know about getting your money working for you. And I stumbled upon the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that's where was the, the start of um, the, the fire within to sort of learn about entrepreneurship because, you know, let's face it, entrepreneurship is just a sexy word for a small business. Um, and that was in 2010 prior to me moving to the US. And so I spent the sort of 2011 in Australia learning as much as I could about what I could do in Australia, fix and flip, lease options, you know, stuff that, you know, people know and do here. Um, but then when I moved to the US, you know, to chase, you know, this girl who did my wife, Erica, I was sort of, I, I'd already 
you know, got the momentum going. And so within two weeks of being fresh off the boat, I think I was at my first you know, networking event in New York City, which was on steroids compared to what you know I was experienced back in Australia, which was a very, very small you know, meetup group. And this, you know, here's New York City, a, a RIA, a real estate investment association, you know, with 200, 300 people in the room, right? There was just, it was insane. Um, so that was already had the bug, came here, and there's just, you know, kismet that America has so much more access to information compared to where I was from. And I was just blown away at just at that access to information. You know, you pay 20, 30 bucks at the door of these RIAs and you get to network and be around other real estate investors and 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 through that I was able to get my first property purchased which was in Syracuse New York which was a 4 hour drive away from New York City I couldn't afford anything in New York City and I bought my first property for $38,000 and and again the no no properties exist for $38,000 in Australia so to come here and realize there's this incredible opportunity to make money in real estate investing um plus with all the access to to information at the time, you know, today it's just you know it's it's a hundredfold. Um, it was it was really just an, an eye opener and game changer for me, and it was just about taking that action. Um, I'd already moved halfway across the world, you know, taking action on buying a small triplex in upstate New York was was small fries compared to you know moving my life halfway across the globe. Sure, I, I actually really like that you know sort of perspective side of it. It's like okay, <laughs> you, you you displace from everything that you know and come here now. Luckily, you had you had your wife, your now wife, and so, so something to come to a new country with to and and you know sort of make yourself into that culture. But so, but you, as you said, you took action. You took action to move here. You took action to to get that first um, real estate deal. And then how how do you? And I think you know go. Obviously, there's a difference between you know the triplex in Syracuse to now what you've done. Uh, in multifamily. So how did you make that transition? Was that something that you sort of realized you wanted to do quickly or was there kind of over time you're like, mm, I want to, I want to figure out how to scale. I, I think in general, the reason I bought my triplex in, in upstate New York with, with, with the very little money that I had that I'd saved from my corporate job um, was it, it was the only, it was the most amount of units I could afford with that money that I'd saved. Right. So I'd, I think I'd already subconsciously wanted to be involved in large deals. It actually was through a conversation I had with a good friend of mine in New York city um, on the Christmas of 2013. You know, he, he's from Canada. I'd studied civil engineering with him in Australia and he came down. I don't know what he was doing in New York, but we went up for a drink and I was boasting, I think boasting to him, I should say at the time that I, I had, I think one triplex, a duplex, and I was looking to do a fix and flip in Philly. And I was, you know, what's that, set five, six units, you know, like very, like, and I was, you know, I'm, I'm crushing it, you know what I mean? And he goes on to tell me about how he'd closed on a 70 unit. And I was like, 70, like seven zero. And he's like, yeah, 70 units. And I don't, sort of had heard about the bigger stuff, but, you know, he's talking about other people's money. He's talking about, you know, getting a mentor. He's talking about selling, carried financing. And I was like, here's a bloke, good friend of mine, who's just now set the bar at where I wanted, you know, what I, where I probably wanted to go, thinking I was you know crushing it already, but I but but here's someone else in my in my circle, who was already crushing it at a different level, and it was all the things that I'd heard of, again I'd heard at these rear events, you know, seller carryback financing, getting a coach, you know, syndication, other people's money, and it was just going out and and having that proof of concept that someone I knew that felt obtainable to me, so that was sort of the the, the catalyst to then go into okay, well I need a mentor. Because at this point, I'd been self-educating for probably three or four years in 2013, or well, three years now, because 2010 was when I picked up the book Red Shirt Poor Dad. And it was about a time where, you know, I remember going to those you know, seminars where people are running to the back of the room to sign up for the weekend boot camp with the guru for $20,000. And you feel like you're doing something, but actually you're doing nothing. <laughs> and I had put that off and thought, well, I'm going to go buy my first property and that's going to be my you know, mentor, Right. But then after doing a few little deals, there was only so much like you need a you need a, someone in your corner. And if I wanted to play at a bigger game, that was where my mate Scott had sort of talked about, you know, a mentor. And that's where I went out and found the cheapest mentor I could find at the time, <laughs> who also was sort of like wasn't gray hair, right? I wanted someone who was sort of a little bit older than me, but you know, was already doing what I wanted to do. And sure. through that, I was able to, you know, start. You know, he he really forced me to start a podcast, and this was 2014, early days of the podcast. The book in the background, investing in the U.S. That's the name of the podcast, investing in the U.S. And it was about my story 
of learning, being an expat, coming to the US, learning about the investment lingo here, learning about multifamily real estate, because that doesn't even exist in Australia, learning about EIN numbers and LLCs and you know, getting your money working for you. And, and it was just interviewing others at the time about you know, the benefits of investing here. Um, and that helped me then sort of raise money some to some to some extent. Um, so that was in 2013, 2014. And then in early 2015, in 2014, relocated to Los Angeles. And I did sort of another thing that was quite pivotal in my growth was I was sick of engineering at the time. And I was like, look, I can't leave the workforce right now. I needed, to, I didn't have my green card yet. So I, if I wanted to stay in this country, I needed another visa. I needed to continue being in corporate America. And I remember working for a very brief period of time with a structural engineering firm in Los Angeles, and they were the structural engineer for a developer in Long Beach doing multifamily building, right? And I was like, you know what? I'm sick and tired of being an engineer. Like, I do not want to be an engineer. I don't want to get my CPNG. I don't want to get my, you know, PE license. I want to go and you know, learn from the big boys. And I just reached out to this developer and I said, hey, look, you know, I, I already work for the engineering company. I'm not going to mention them. Who's doing the structural engineering on your, you know, 150 unit, you know, uh, urban infill, you know, podium style construction? Would you be looking for a project manager with this, with my, with my background? And they said yes. They said hell yeah, we are. We would love you to come on board because you have a skill set that we just don't have being a developer. And for the next four years, I went off and learnt more. Plus, you know, combined the podcast, combined raising money on the side, I was also learning in my day job. So I was sort of being surrounded by real estate 24 seven over that period of four years. I was also able to lead four of my own syndications. And I was able at two, at the end of 2017, quit um, the day job because I'd got married to Erica. So I got the green card, had done some syndications on my own as a lead syndicator and was learning from big developers and the best in the business. So plus, you know, building the brand around that uh, with, with the podcast and stuff. So, a lot of things looking back, you think, oh, geez, that's that that all fell into place really nicely for you. It's like I didn't think consciously at the time about it. it. Was just like putting one step in front of the other. And when you put your head up, you're like, oh, that that worked out quite well. <laughs> yeah. So it was, but but the the lesson there for people listening is we all have skill sets. It's about trying to continue to grow your knowledge base. You know, not I, I, it took me eight years. Before, before the time I picked up Rich Dad Poor Dad, by the time I quit the, the corporate life, it takes a long time. And so many people in this space think they're going to do it in 12 months. And some people, some freaks might be able to, but there is that period in between where you've got to keep the you know the roof over your head. You've got to keep the lights on. Yeah. And so using a skill set and going and working in a corporate job to continue to grow, and that in any industry, it doesn't have to be real estate investing. It, it's 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 understanding what that skill is and you're being valuable to that person who you want to learn from to continue your your education to get to the point where you can then you know flap your own wings and fly off from the nest yeah yeah i i mean some really good points i mean one, one thing kudos to your friend that told you to start a podcast in 2014 because like now everybody has a podcast, obviously, <laughs> like, like no, nobody, th n you could ask any of my friends, they like ever thought I would have a podcast, but, but the, the idea, it, it, I think you were in that, you know, kind of in a, in the early stages of where podcasts were getting big. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, from, from an outreach standpoint, getting to be, you know, set up your, your thought leadership platform, you wrote a book, like you, you mentioned earlier, you know, taking action and, and it, you took, you took strategic action and all of those things, when you list them out in like a nice little five minute, you know, kind of <laughs> summary, it's like, Oh, of course do this, this, and this. Right. But, but the point about, you know, that, that was over eight years and, right. and you were, you know, doing, doing things in your, your work life to structure it towards real estate. It's like, you're right. So many people are, you know, and it's, I guess we're all guilty of it too, because it's like, you'll see a podcast episode and it's like 300 units in six months. And it's yes. like everybody too, that's the one you want to listen to because you're like, I want 300 units in six months. Right. But th that's not normally what happens, right? Is normally it's like your story of, hey, I did all of these things and and yeah, I was finding success, but it, it it's not a, it's not a quick 
thing. It's not a, it, you know, it's not a, a get rich quick. It's, you know, it's not, it's not get rich quick, poor dad, and or sorry, it's not get rich uh, quick dad and get rich poor dad. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's a, it takes time and it takes a lot of work. You took, you did a lot of work into it and it, it's, uh, you know, so I, I really, I appreciate that, you know, part of the story where it's, you know, it's not just like, uh, I bought a triplex. Now I'm a, no, yeah, three thousand. No, units. that's like it, it. It doesn't happen that way. <laughs> it doesn't happen like that, and it, it's it. You know, it's, I'm not for cliches, but the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, the the, the three three hundred units in six months. You you probably dig deeper into someone's story like that. You understand they'd be going at it for ten years. You know what I mean? Like it's it's right. not just, and 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 there's a difference between being a lead sponsor and you know right. raising money on, right. on 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 certain people. So there's so many stories that I'm more than happy to, to share with you uh, during that journey because there was dark times and there was, you know, working 60, 70 hours a week at the development job and then trying to squeeze in. And, 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 and I'm in Los Angeles, right? So I'm trying to fly to out of state markets on the, over the lo like long weekends and work from home on Fridays to you know, look at deals and network with people and try and get that first deal under contract. And it, it takes a lot. Um, and, and it's not, it's it, it's not easy at all you know if, if this was easy everyone would be doing it so yeah 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 absolutely and it, it's um yeah i mean I, I i totally understand that you know sort of trying to maintain a job you've got you know it's not cheap to live in los angeles that's for sure and so you've got to have some way to to continue to live while you're trying to grow this and yes at the end of the day the rewards are great but it it just doesn't happen overnight. You're not going to, you know, suddenly be a, a wealthy real estate owner or, or operator or whatever it is, you know, in, in six months. So it, it there is certainly a, a level of commitment to it for the long term to, to get, you know, to that, to that point of success. Um, you mentioned that there were some dark times. Mm -hmm. You want to, you want to share yeah. something? I, yeah, I think that, sure, uh, sure. I think that those, interestingly myself having sort of i don't know i guess i'm coming out of one but the similar uh, or, or had some some challenges here i found that a lot of people said to me as i was going through it yeah we've all been there blah 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 that sort of thing but that's not on the podcasts that's mm -hmm. not on social media like that's not stuff that i feel like a lot of people talk about so it, mm -hmm. i just think it might be might yeah. be you know beneficial I, to people to I, hear I, something that you know didn't go quite right. <laughs> well, it's not necessarily what it go quite right. It just life hits you smack in the face, right? So um at the end of 2017, so my my mum, so I'm a, I'm Australian, I'm living abroad. I'm the only part of my family living over here chasing this dream, right? At the end of two thousand at the end of 2014, as the podcast starts, as I'm transitioning into this new development job, I get word my mom is quite ill with uh with uterine uterus cancer, um, which is rocks my world. My my young younger sister passed away when I was 11 years old. She was six. So cancer is quite close to my, you know, close to the bone of my family. And so I have another sister um, who sort of bear, bore, bear, bore <laughs> all the sort of the stress as, as, you know, reads, reads abroad. And I really struggled with, you know, being here and, and should I go home and, and, and give up, you know, the, chasing the dream and, all that stuff because it it was just like what am I doing you know like I felt selfish, um, and she my mom made it to my wedding in two thousand. Unfortunately, passed away. Um, that was the catalyst to quit the day job. So not not only did I get the, the green card, but it was like and I don't know if I can swear on this podcast, but I was like yes. know, WTF? Yeah. <laughs> what, the, what, what the fuck? What the fuck am I doing? chasing and at that point of being three and a half years you know grinding so freaking hard at the day job but also then i'd done as i said three going on my fourth syndication as a lead sponsor um it was just it was just so much um and i just i was nearly breaking point because i was you know trying to build a company you know, with with a business partner who was also sort of working part-time same time and it was the two of us and raising money and, and and working on weekends and taking phone calls from the bathroom so your boss doesn't find out like and then you know your mum passes away it was just like yeah what what am i fucking doing you know like and it, it really got me clarity and i did an episode on the podcast as she passes away about priorities versus goals and as much as the guilt i was carrying around with you know 
pursuing what I pursue. I, my, my, my family always told me it was just like, like your mum would want you to be doing what you wanted you to be doing. Like she'll be, she's the biggest supporter of you keep going. But it, it, it got me around what is a priority in life and what is a goal and what are you doing this for? Like piss or get off the pot, you know, go, mm-hmm. go all in. And I was a little bit like probably the last 12 months in my development job, I was probably just keeping it just to not burn any bridges. And that's just the way I am as a human being. But I could have just, not that I could have gone faster, but it was just like, maybe I had the free time to go back more. I don't know. You know, like it was just, there's all these things that go through your head about that and, and did I do the right thing or not? Um, you know, subsequently, you know, looking back, it's, I did what I did and I, I guess I'm proud of it or I'm not proud of it. I don't know. I don't know, but, but it was, it was tough. You know, when, when you, when you finally lose your mom and, and obviously I lost my sister many, many years ago and just, it's tough on the family and it's tough on, on, you know, as a family unit, right. And then to try and be abroad and chase this dream was just like, you know, bananas at some, at some point. So yeah, that was, that was sort of the, the, the clarity to, to get me like, you know, piss or get off the pot because you're not going to, you know, life is short and you need to be getting off and, and, and doing what you want to be doing. And, and why are you doing all of this? If you can't have time to go back and be with family or loved ones in time of need. So it was a, it was a very a clarifying moment for me. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that. I, I think uh, that's obviously a, a personal story. I'm sorry for the loss. Um, but, but it, you know, I guess the, the, the take home message is maybe, you know, life, life doesn't stop. Right. You know, life, life doesn't, life keeps going on while you're trying to achieve these big goals. And you have to figure out a way to, you know, sort of, I guess, reconcile that with your, you know, in your mind, it's like, you know, I, for me, it's it, a lot of it is, you know, like I, I have this vision of what, what this is going to do for my family, but I also sometimes like, well, am I, <laughs> am I, am I not spending time with my family now because I'm trying to look at this future thing? What are you, you know, so you, you struggle with that, but also it drives you. Cause the, as you said, you know, if I get off the pot, like I better make it mean something then. Right. Right. If, if I'm going to miss some things because I'm trying to achieve something big that I believe in, I better make every minute mean something. And if, if I find myself, you know, kind of sitting back, taking it easy, I'm like, no, no, I, I don't have time for that. Like, like my kids, my kids want to play, <laughs> my kids want to read a book. My kids want to want to do a puzzle. Like they, they, you know, so it's just kind of having that, uh, using those experiences where you do have that, like, why am I doing this moment and, and putting that as using it as fuel to the fire. And it was, it was also actually the con, the convert, the convex of that statement. It was also around, um, someone told me, you know, when you're 70 years of age being with your grandkids and do they really care if you had a thousand units in 2018 or a thousand units in 2025? And it was sort of more understanding and being in yourself, self-worth to say like, I know I can grind. I know I'm a grinder. Mm-hmm. This is going to work it may take me longer than what I'm expecting it to. And that's okay. I think that was a really big you know, pivotal moment. And it's easy again to look back in hindsight to say like, oh yeah, of course you got to all the, your false indications, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. But it was, you know, the, the, you know there's, there's a voice in the back of your head say, well, you wouldn't have got to this point without doing that work and that sacrifice at that time. Thus you lost time with mom or your kids or the, doing the puzzle and, mm-hmm it always weighs on you. So, but it's just the, it's always a balance, right? Trying to enjoy the journey along the way, knowing that your one, you know, your worth is, and you can hustle and this is going to work. Just give it goddamn time. But two, you know, yeah, there's other thing like, I want it to happen tomorrow. (laughs) And it's that, that constant balance, right. As you, as you, as you navigate this path of, because there's always going to be another mountain to climb, right. You always will climb, you get to a peak and you're like, great. All right. What's the next one? You know, like, and it's just trying to, again, as cliche as it might sound, enjoy the journey. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that because, I mean, I felt like closing my first deal was one of the most anticlimactic things I've ever experienced. <laughs> it was like, because it there's so much work that goes into it, right? And you're also mm-hmm. like, everybody's like, the first, you got to get the first deal. Once you get the first deal under your belt, 
it, then everything starts to fall into place. And it, it's true. It's true. Like you close the first deal and suddenly every, every, every broker wants to talk to you and all this. So th those things are true. But the day you close the deal, it's congratulations, you close. Like it's an email from the lender mm -hmm. and it, it's it's just kind of like, now the real, real work works up. Right, right. Now we actually have to manage it. Now we have to, you know, it's, and so it's it's kind of a funny, it, there, there is, there's always another mountain. There's always another um, goal to reach. And and that's that's because in general, entrepreneurs are driven people. And so it's like, mm -hmm. if there wasn't another one, you'd probably be bored, right? So it's like, that's why you do another deal and another deal and another deal. It's, it's just kind of, you, you get bored just doing one. Well, that, you, you, you're correct, but I think it's also the reward you get. Like, it's funny how you mentioned I was, when I did my first deal, the same thing. It was so, such a, like, I've got a gray patch in the back of my head because it was so goddamn stressful. Um, but it was then to take the, the moment to celebrate. And, it, and I think as entrepreneurs, we've got to train ourselves to do that because we've worked yeah. so freaking hard to get to where we, to close that deal. And it's like, got to keep grinding. If you don't stop at that point and say, I'm going to go away for the weekend. And I love traveling, right? That's that's my thing. I love traveling. I love surfing. If I don't try and do something to celebrate, and it could be as little as just going out with your, your, your missus or your boyfriend or your partner yeah. or taking it to dinner, right? It could just be something to, you, you, you and you're physically doing it. It's not just like, yay, thanks, high five, get back to work. It's like taking time to pause and reflect and be like, you know, the reason I closed on that deal was to was to do X with my family, was to do X with mm -hmm. my travel, or was to do X with my free yeah. time. And then start to train the brain and to be like, every time I close, I get a treat. <laughs> and that treat. Right. And so then you then you know to celebrate because we all get so caught up in the the next one, the next one, the big one, the big one, the next big one, the next big one. But you have to have those points of, of, of pausing, celebrating, awesome work, let's move on. You know, because yeah. otherwise you will just yeah. you'll fly by and you won't you'll be again you'll be like what am i doing this for <laughs> yeah so yeah. no it's a, i mean it's a it's a great point and i think so many of us don't unless you make that because there is always more to do right the minute, the minute you close it it's got to be managed right it's not like it's not like you close it and the work's done you can close it and now you have you know years of work to to get it where you want it so it's um it, it's a it's a really really good point on that now you know, in within syndication, um, there are di generally different roles, right? Mm -hmm. every, every, you know, there's you know, acquisitions, capital raising, asset management, you know, underwriting. Those are kind of, I think, the you know, the four big ones that people talk about. But wh wh where do you where do you fit yourself into that? What 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 kind of uh, roles are you role or roles? I guess are you playing within your your business? Well, I'm, I'm the lead sponsor, right? Um, I've always been the lead sponsor on all my deals besides a few early ones where I was you know, co-GPing um, and just raising money back in the day. But today, it's you know, my, my position looks a lot different to when I was grinding that nine, you know, nine to five and closing that first syndication. Um, I have employees now. I have a team. Um, but I, like, we are still working as an entity to, to raise more and more money in-house. Um, but right now we do, we do everything from soup to nuts. It's, 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 it's the acquisition, it's the pipeline. It's, you know, underwriting 20 deals a week to find that one deal that you really want to, you know, focus on It's the broker relationships. It's making sure, uh, you're raising capital and on podcasts and doing stuff. It's, it's talking to other co-GPs who can come in and partner with you. It's then getting your know, lender relationships and getting to the, to the closing line. It's, it's having enough earnest money deposit to go and put it, you know, a 300 unit deal under contract. It's having enough liquidity to go and do that as, as an individual. Then once you close, it's the construction management, the asset management, institutional quality reporting to our investors. All of that runs within the business today. It's just at what speed is each task running at? Some are running and you know, just really, really good. And other tasks, we've got to, we've got to get, get going. But ultimately now it's my role as you know, the leader of the company is to make sure all those tasks, and I've got good bums in every seat, controlling each vertical of the business to make sure the the, the, the thing is running you know smoothly uh, as best we can so um yeah it looks different today than what it did when i first started sure yeah i think a lot of people start and they're sort of you know wearing all of the hats right you're doing mm -hmm. doing a little bit of everything yourself and then and then you get to that point where you're i mean really do reach a point where you just can't it's not possible to do it all yourself if you're doing you know a number of deals um you can you might be able to do one mid-sized deal by yourself but you're not going to be able to keep doing that forever if you want to scale how did you how did you build your team and what, what 
you know, how, how do you make that transition from, from being the guy to being the guy who leads everyone, you know, that kind of, that. In, in the beginning, it actually know. was when I was back in um, the, the, the W2, but, but working the hustle on the side, it was actually finding a partner who could be my yin to my yang. I came from institutional ground up development. I knew how to manage things. I knew how to, you know, I taught myself how to underwrite things. So I, I just came from the tools, so to speak. Uh, he came from more of a marketing background. He was boots on the ground. Um, he's, we're now not partners today. We've gone our separate ways, but we built something pretty awesome, just the two of us. Uh, I think we were nearly a thousand units deep before we even brought on an assistant. Um, so, you know, that we, we just sort of divide and conquered. Now, today, and, and you do that because you don't have any money in the beginning. You can't afford to bring on anyone else. You, you partner with people, right? Today, I have had fortunate that we've come full cycle on, on, on a lot of deals and, and, and you know, I, I made good money myself. I'm not going to lie. Now I could have put my acorns away like a, like a chipmunk and, and hide them away personally, or I could reinvest that money into good talent. And I've decided to do that. And that reinvesting that money into good talent has allowed me to then become more of a visionary in the company and, you know, hire the integrator, hire the, you know, the, 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 the sales and marketing, hire the financing, you know, hire the operations in, 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 in me focusing to make sure we're going in the right direction as a whole. And that looks, you know, but I've worn all the hats and I've come through, you know, every single part of element of the business in order to make sure that we, that every person in seats that I hire today is doing the right job because I've been there myself. Yeah. That, you know, sort of CEO or, or, integrator, whatever you want to call it. I had just interviewed Brandon Turner last week and he he was calling it the the energy or the architect. You know, everybody has their mm -hmm. sort of picture of what that visionary looks like. And um it, it's a it's a pretty I feel like it's a really fantastic spot to be in once you get there. And now you have now you're 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 sort of you know obviously the vision but you're also just the problem solver, right? You're going mm -hmm. in, and if something's not going according to plan, that's that's your role. Step in and, and kind of get that piece of the puzzle back on track. Um, I think it's just, but but again, I don't. I hope people realize that you know that the work that you put in to get to that point, and you know just where you could then turn around and say, okay, now it's now it's time to to put these pieces of the puzzle, put this talent in the right position. And, and really, it, I would imagine at that point, re in reality, that's when you can really scale. That's when you can you know, start going at a higher level. It, 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 yes, yes and no. Um, yes, because it's, you know, I was in the former partnership that I was involved in. I probably was the integrator, right? And, and my business partner ended up being more the visionary. And that probably caused friction to, to where I wanted to lead my own ship, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, as they say, um, you know, you, you might need your own ranch one day. Um, and, but, but then to learn to delegate is extremely hard and to learn to create the right roles and responsibilities and the job postings to attract good talent and to have then, you know, the, the confidence that you're going to go spend six figures on, you know, a chief investment officer, for example, right. that that's going to be worth investment in five or six years time because you're, doing you're building it today right and 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 you got to look at your own bank account and go, oh, how long can i how, how long can i support these salaries for yeah. and that's scary in itself but knowing that you know and i actually interviewed turner as well on my podcast and he talks about you know, there's a diy and i think there's the project manager and then there's the coo and then there's the architect right and we all go through you've got to go through all the stages in order to build something from scratch but also to understand what it takes and what type of personality it takes in those specific roles to make sure your business is going to be successful. And, and that in itself is, is tough to learn as a, you know, as a, you know, called a new visionary, a new architect, a, a new whatever CEO that takes time and, and effort as well in itself to say, well, no, I'm, I'm setting these guys up for, for success and I need to let them go off and make not necessarily failures, but, but go off and let them do their job. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the, definitely interesting. The, the ability to sort of, step back and let them, you know, succeed and sort of fail on their own. And and then you, you go in and, you know, kind of make some adjustments, but it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a fascinating position to be in, but I also think, uh, 
you've got to find the right people. You've got to find, get the right systems in place. It's not, you can't just start like, okay, now I'm hiring a, a right. you know, whatever investor relations, you use that example. Like you can't just start <laughs> grabbing people and being like, okay, now go do it. You know, you, you do have to uh, make sure that, you know, your values align and, and they're going to fit within, in the company culture that you're trying to create and, and, you know, the, the, the business running the way that you want to run it. Right. And look, I can even break it down into, I remember the first person, not necessarily hired, but the first um, 1099 I brought on because I was working full time. I didn't have enough time to underwrite deals, but I needed someone to, to just help just go through the data. And I remember hiring two kids from undergraduate USC for 20 bucks an hour. Again, I don't know if I had 20 bucks an hour to spare, but I knew that if I implemented this business, this system, this is going back 2014, 15, that I, they're going to be under underwrite so many more deals because I'm working full time. I've got, you know, my, my relationship with my, my then girlfriend, now wife, you know, I've got my own personal you know, health and you know, social being. Um, and so just, there's little ways in your business that you can start in order to then you know, build the foundation to where I'm building today, which is full-time employees, full-time systems, you know, and, and paying big salaries. Um, but it does start with the delegation back in the day is, you know, little things like finding someone to help you underwrite or finding someone to, you know, simply just clean the house because you don't have, you don't have time to clean the house yeah. and you've got other bit of bigger and better things to do. And they, a lot yeah. of people talk about that, but that is the start. That is the crumb that leads to the cake that is today, which is how am I building the team to be successful? Who's the butt in the, in the seat in order for the business to be successful and, and go at a pace that I couldn't run at. And again, we're talking to Turner on my podcast. He talks also about, a, a, maybe it wasn't him, but you know, when we start, we're on a little tricycle, just us pushing this little tricycle with our own little feet. And then we graduate to a mountain bike and then a mountain bike to a road bike and then a motorcycle. And then we finally get in the car and that car's got a dashboard. And then all of a sudden we're going to get into a, a, a fast plane, right? There's all different elements of the business and how quickly you're going and the different ways of getting each vehicle, you know, moving forward. Uh, you know, obviously with a tricycle, just you, you know, with a car, you can fit a couple of people in the seats around you. So, but you're also going at a lot faster pace at an airplane, you know, you can fit a lot more people in there and you're going at a lot quicker pace. So there's just different ways in which you get started to lead down to the path of what, what I guess I'm trying to say is that this is new, new roles for myself and new um, uh, skill sets, but it's not that I haven't been building or working on that as I've developed the business over the years. Yeah. Yeah, I get. I haven't heard the uh, sort of vehicle analogy. I like that. That's a. I'll I'll, uh, I'll credit that to you because I have not <laughs> not heard it before. But but it, but it makes sense. It's it's right. It's it, you know you're starting off slow and then you're you're gradually you know putting the people around you and and moving at a faster pace. Um, it's really. It, it, I I am fascinated to see you know and in, in here like how people build the business and how they grow. So um, thank you for kind of sharing that. Okay. Um, well, Reed, let's let's switch gears um, to, you know, I'll get to the part where I ask you all the questions I like to ask each guest and we'll keep you all day, uh, as interesting as it is. Um, first question for you is based on the name of the show being Know Your Why. So so what is your why? What, what kind of keeps you going towards these uh, greater and greater success? I think uh, unfulfilled potential is a pretty big why in my in my life. You know, I I, I want to be the best version of myself, whatever that looks like. You know, husband, father, you know, brother, <laughs> son, yeah. you know, entrepreneur. So um, yeah, I think you know that's been the underlying push and motivation from when I first got started was to you know never have fear of regret right and fear of that I would you know wake up when I'm 70 and do you go geez I wish I gave that a go um and and you know sort of put you know I'm probably a person who can live with a bit of uncertainty unlike the average folk and I think being an entrepreneur you need to be so so uncertainty the fear of you know um you're missing out or regret and then you're know, making sure you're fulfilling yourself in terms of potential yeah absolutely I love that um Tell us something about yourself that that maybe isn't common knowledge. Uh, we we know you're Australian, but uh, mm -hmm. maybe some some special skill or hobby that uh, you know just let people know you better. I love surfing. That's being an Aussie. But uh, one thing I grew up actually riding uh, horses uh, back in the day, mm -hmm. and I'm a very I'm six foot two, and um, I used to do some you know. We used to get old ex race horses from the track, and uh, because I used to pre train race horses for extra pocket money in high school, 
and then I'd, whatever horse didn't make the race track, I'd see if he could jump over jumps and maybe I could sell it for a few extra bucks. <laughs> uh, it, it was nothing glamorous. And you, it's not what you think, you know, you think of wealthy people. And my parents were both high school teachers. It was just like, we had a little farm and, um, you know, I really, really, really enjoyed horse riding and, uh, and show jumping. And it came from, uh, you know, pre-training race horses back in the day, because I was a little heavier than the average jockey. They would get me on there and, um, it'd be good for the, the horse to, to get used to a heavier weight. And then they transfer the jockey over later on. So, yeah. Interesting. I hadn't, hadn't thought about it that way. You still get to ride? Not here, not in much anymore. You know, with, with everything going on with life, I'd love to get back into it one day, but um, it's, it's a bloody expensive sport. I can tell you that. <laughs> yes. I have, I have enough, a lot of friends with horses and my, my children are young, but you know, my daughters, we, they did some pony ride thing at school and she just, lost her mind she loved it and they're like oh you're gonna have to get a horse i'm like mm, no, yeah they're not we're not picking up that hobby that hobby this young boy like, yeah exactly you'll be, you be, you be standing at the paddock throwing money into the paddock until right they, exactly know, exactly <laughs> yeah we can't we certainly don't we we certainly don't have the space here to have a horse so it's yeah. it would be everything would just be you know burning up money so someday <laughs> maybe later um when people hear this and they uh, want to get in touch what's the best way Easiest way is to go to reedgoosens.com. That's R-E-E-D-G-O-O-S-S-E-N-S.com. And if you're ever coming through Los Angeles and you want to meet me up for a drink or lunch or coffee or whatever, and just want to talk some shop, you can hit me up at info. That's I-N-F-O at reedgoosens.com. Perfect. Final question for you, Reed. What's a piece of advice you would give to someone who is getting started in real estate, kind of, you know, want to want to, want to to plant their flag and, and make a go at it? Look, uh, I, I got a quote this to my dad um he just he's a high school teacher great at what he does what he did he always brought me up with the uh saying a fool and their money are easily parted so don't be that fool and it really goes back if you think about that saying it's like go out and educate yourself you know get get knowledgeable um whatever means that is whether you go to university or not or if you go through you know i'm self-educated in terms of real estate investing but go out and get some education around it learn from others um before making you know bold decisions about investing so don't be a fool with your money great great piece of advice um well well thank you so much thank you for for sharing your story uh, i think people are really going to enjoy this um kind of hearing about you and um everything that you've you've done to to reach the level of success that you have it's very very inspiring thanks mike awesome all right well, I know everybody's going to love this episode, so please like, rate, and review uh, when you hear it so we can get more great guests like Reed. Re I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.